<coughs> before we start church. I got this email today, which is up here, but I'm going to read it for the people who can't see it. There are three good arguments that Jesus was black. He called everyone brother. He liked gospel. And he didn't get a fair trial. Then there were three equally good arguments that Jesus was Jewish. He went into his father's business. He lived at home until he was 33. He was sure his mother was a virgin, and his mother was sure he was a god. Then there were three equally good arguments that Jesus was Italian. He talked with his hands, he had wine with his meals, and he used olive oil. And there were also three equally good arguments that Jesus was a Californian. He never cut his hair, he walked around barefoot all the time, and he started a new religion. And there were three equally good arguments that Jesus was an American Indian. He was at peace with nature, he ate a lot of fish, and he talked about the Great Spirit. And there were three equally good arguments that Jesus was Irish. He never got married, he was always telling his stories, and he loved green pastures. And there were three more good reasons and arguments why, why that Jesus was Mexican. He treated his mom like she was a saint, he always wore latandas and a serape, and he was a carpenter who could fix anything. But the most compelling evidence of all, three proofs that Jesus was a woman. He fed a crowd at a moment's notice when there was virtually no food. He kept trying to get a message across to a bunch of men who just didn't get it. And even when he was dead, he had to get up because there was so much work to do. <laughs> So, we are still religious. Okay, does anybody guess what the theme is for today? Animal, yes. <laughs> it's love your animal. So that's kind of where we're going today. Uh, I guess we can talk about this early. Uh, anybody, has anybody heard about Lou? Anybody from here? Lou tested positive for the virus oh, really? during the week. Okay. So thankfully, we are doing our distancing. We're doing our hand washing. Everybody was wearing masks. So I'm not uh, worried about it. But we want to continue on that. Uh, regimen, everybody be very careful, keep washing your hands, keep using the disinfectant, we have disinfectant in each pew, and uh, keep your distance and wear your mask, and I have mine, but since I'm so far away, I'm going to be using it up here, but if I come down, I will. Uh, Margaret, because uh, Montgomery County is on the purple alert, she's not going to travel, so, and that's, I would recommend anybody who has any, any concerns about that, stay home, we're, we'll keep broadcasting on Facebook. But if you feel like you want to come, we got plenty of distance and plenty. I think I think we're safe here. I'm not really worried about it. But if you're concerned about it, don't hesitate to stay home and isolate. Is Mike doing okay? Is Mike is okay. Yeah. Mike said he was he's nervous about it, so he's staying home. But he said he, he's, he's having no symptoms and no problems. And Lou, I think, is just having mild symptoms. He was having like cold and flu-like symptoms, so he went in and got tested, and it turned out he was positive. So I have no idea where he was exposed or how long ago it was or anything else. But if he was if he was diagnosed this week and he was here last Sunday, that means he he was a possibly a carrier or a spreader last Sunday when he was here. Yeah. Yeah. But if you if anybody knew, everybody even when we stayed after church, everybody kept their masks on. Everybody kept six feet apart. So I think we followed all the rules, and I think we'll I think we'll be all right. But I don't want anybody to take any chances. Uh, if you don't feel safe, don't do that, because we can keep on doing this as long as we have music and the, the slide presentations. Uh, any other news that anybody wants to bring up? We're almost time to start here. Oh, fish Sunday! This is the first Sunday of the month. I put the fish plate out. And I would announce to anybody on Facebook or anybody that's uh, concerned, you can drop off 
canned goods or dry goods or anything else at the church, just leave them at the door or leave them at the back door. There's somebody here almost every day, and we will transport them into the fish collection point in Greenville. Uh, so let's share with our uh, less fortunate brothers and sisters at this uh, most needy time of the year. All right. Uh, let's... As soon as we get the chimes, we will start, which would be any minute now during my watch. Oh, I know what we can do. No, I guess we can't do it. We need the chimes.
Very nice. Thank you, Lloyd. Music is essential, and I don't care what anybody says, canned music will never measure up to real music. Okay, uh, let's see. Opening words, all animals are our relatives, by Florence Caplow. We light this chalice in honor of the animal realm. Furred and hoofed, two-legged, four-legged, many-legged, fanged and clawed, <clears throat> gentle and fierce, wild and tame. May we, may we remember that all animals are our relatives, worthy of our care and respect. And we'll light the candles. Perfect, heedless of the wind and weather. It must have been written by an order. Our affirmation <clears throat> Be the blessing you already are by John Gibb Millspaw and Sarah Gibb Millspaw. In our religious tradition, it is not just ministers and religious professionals who have the power to bless. Ministers and religious professionals who have the power to bless, 
Each of us has the power to bless another and to bless the world. Therefore, I invite everyone here to participate in this blessing and those of you at home. The words are ordinary words, but we make the blessing real through our shared intention. As we have been blessed, let's see, let the tab up here. Okay. So I'm going to read it, it says you can't. As we have been blessed, so we bless one another to be a blessing. Breathe in, breathe out. This breath we share with all that breathes. Feel the love of the universe flowing through this community into you and out into the universe again. Let the love of all the universe, your love, flow outward to its height, its depth, its broad extent. You are more than you know and more beloved than you know. Take up what power is yours to create a safe haven, to make of earth a heaven. Give hope to those you encounter that they may know safety from inner and outer harm. Be happy and at peace, healthy and strong, caring and joyful. Be the blessing you already are. This is enough. Blessed be. Amen. All right, children's story. The Fox and the Crow. This is a classic from uh, Aesop, uh, somewhat updated in its presentation, <clears throat> but still has a moral, which is what we're looking for in church. One bright morning, as the fox was following his sharp nose through the wood in search of a bite to eat, he saw a crow on the limb of a tree overhead. There was by no means the first crow the fox had ever seen. What caught his attention this time, however, and made him stop for a second look, was that the lucky crow had a bit of cheese in her beak. No need to search any farther, thought the sly master fox. Here is a dainty bite for my breakfast. He was referring to the cheese, not the crow. And up he trotted to the foot of the tree in which the crow was sitting. And looking up admiringly, he cried, Good morning, beautiful creature. He must have been a car salesman in his second life. The crow, her head cocked to one side, watched the fox suspiciously like a car buyer, but she kept her beak tightly closed on the cheese and did not return his greeting. What a charming creature she is, said the fox, and how her feathers shine, and what a beautiful form and what splendid wings. Such a wonderful bird should have a very lovely voice, since everything else about her is so perfect. Could she sing just one song? I know I should hail her the queen of birds. Listening to these flattering words, the crow forgot all her suspicion and also her breakfast. She wanted very much to be called the queen of birds, so she opened her beak wide to utter her loudest caw. Isn't that neat what you can do with the computer job? <laughs>
We will light a candle in honor of those joys and concerns now shared. <coughs> Do we have any joys or concerns? Anybody wants to bring forward? And I'm not going to use the microphone because I'm not going to take a chance on passing that microphone around. So just speak up. We remember those who are not here today and those who are, uh, as we mentioned earlier, Lou has been diagnosed positive with uh, the virus. His symptoms are mild uh, and he, everybody is maintaining distance and masking and hand washing the whole time over here. Thanks to Margaret. I came in this morning and sprayed everything. Everything is disinfected, so I am not worried. As long as we keep our distance and everybody maintains their, uh, their vigilance on how to act. So we're right with lighting this one for Lou and hope that all the people that he's had contact with are still in good shape. Uh, if you want to come, feel free. Just keep your distance. If you want to stay home, we completely understand that. Anyone have anything? Okay. This is for those, well, actually, let me throw in something for our ongoing political situation. Things have not really changed. Some people are not admitting that the election was fair, but not that the result of the election has not been uh, affirmed. So we will have to wait till the end of January to see how that's going to play out. But it is a sign, it is a time of trouble, a time of tension, uh, which is something we don't need with all the other problems going on. So for those joys and concerns, those sorrows, those worries, those uh, little problems that nag at your soul, we are there with you. If we can help in any way, please let us know. Uh, if not, know that we are thinking about you at all these times. And our message. <clears throat> this is called Answering the Religious Right with the Big Heart of Universalism by Scott Alexander. This was written, I'm assuming, in the 1990s. How many people remember uh, Pat Buchanan and the religious right? That had to have been in the 90s, maybe even the 80s. I can't, it's running through that time. It was a long time ago. And the scary thing is, it is just as topical today as it was 30 or 40 years ago. All right, as it must be obvious to every one of you, <clears throat> these are times of great tension and conflict in America. Just the same. Many of, much of this turmoil in our nation is focused on what many observers have called the culture wars, the very vocal and visible battles that are occurring on many fronts to determine whose values, principles, and beliefs, and perspectives will determine the shape of American life. In particular, over the last several years, religious and cultural conservatives are waging a fierce battle against what they perceive to be the evils of liberalism, just the same today including the availability of abortion, the same, sex education, you don't hear that that much, but it's the same, the affirmation and protection of gay, lesbian, and bisexual persons, uh, they are losing a little bit on that front, the cultural inclusion of minorities and women by means of multiculturalism and feminism, <coughs> this is still going on, fundamentalist Christians and others are passionately convinced that there has been a dangerous erosion of the old standards of American life. A dangerous shift away from the assumptions and ideas that they believe built and sustained our nation. At a recent meeting of a national group called the Christian Coalition, Pat Buchanan issued his battle cry, we are in a war for the soul of the American people. The persons at the head have changed, the dialogue and the rhetoric has changed a little, but the intent is still the same. I am afraid that Pat Buchanan is right. <clears throat> like it or not, there is not a war being waged in America. The intellectual and spiritual battle lines have been drawn, and a very important struggle is underway between competing ideas and values, between competing visions of what American society is supposed to look like and feel like in the next century, and we're in the next century. I believe it is crucial that we united Unitarian Universalists not sit on the sidelines of these culture wars. As religious people with good and decent vision for human persons and society, we must speak up and stand for our values and beliefs. Speak up and stand up for the principles that gave our religion its large heart and enduring beauty. 
The cultural and religious study of struggle we are now in may seem like a brand new thing to many of you, but nothing could be farther from the truth. 200 years ago, universalism arose in just such a time of deep social conflict. Let us, as we struggle to gain perspective on these conflicted times and how we as a religious people should respond, begin at the beginning. American universalism, like its spiritual sister Unitarianism, began as a radical, optimistic Christian heresy in response to the grim doctrines of the 18th century Calvinistic Puritanism. And remember we talked about the Puritans and the Pilgrims last Sunday. The story of how and why universalism took root in America can perhaps be clearly told by contrasting the messages of two of the greatest preachers of that day, Jonathan Edwards and Hosea Ballou. Jonathan Edwards was the Puritan's Puritan, who was the most renowned preacher of what was called the quote-unquote Great Awakening, an early version of the born-again Christian fundamentalist revival that occurred in the late 1700s. He was an athletic and charismatic man who had the power and predilection during his preaching to bring the whole congregation to fearful wailing as he described the misery and damnation that they deserved and they would receive in hell at the hands of an angry God. Sometimes in the pulpit he would rip off his robes and tear his linen shirt to, to shreds in a self-abasing frenzy and disgust. Listen to a portion of one of his most famous sermons when he tells the listeners they are sinners in the hands of an angry God. This is a quote from him. <clears throat> the world of misery, the lake of burning brimstone is extended abroad underneath you. <clears throat> Hell's gaping mouth wide open and you have nothing to stand on or to take hold of. It is only the power and mere pleasure of God that holds you up. The God that holds you over the pit of hell much as one holds a spider or a sudden loathsome insect over the fire that bores you, you have offended him, O sinner. You hang by a slender thread with the flames of divine wrath flashing about it and ready every moment to singe and burn it asunder. You have nothing to lay hold of save yourself. There is nothing that you have ever done, nothing that you can do to induce God to spare you one moment. Does that scare the pants off of you or what? <laughs> On another happy occasion, <clears throat> Edwards told the browbeaten folk and the powers of whatever God catches, whenever God catches the scent of humanity, the human smell is so foul and putrid that it causes God to flare his nostrils in disgust. Cheerful stuff, this 18th century Puritanism. And these are all sermons that were written down and recorded, so this is exactly what he said. Uh, this was the substance and soul of the predominant Calvinistic theology of the day. <clears throat> God is a distant, angry, and stern judge. Humanity, a fallen and sinful beast, most men and women and children are doomed to a hell of eternal damnation and misery for all of their weakness and wickedness. It was over this dark and forbidding spiritual landscape that blew a fresh, warm breeze of universalism, a theology of love, reconciliation, and hope. Early universalists, in direct spiritual contradiction to Puritanism's gloomy gospel, simply proclaimed that the essential qualities of God were not wrath, disgust, and judgment, but goodness, mercy, and love. The heartfelt good news of universalism was that by God's grace and power, all of God's children, every man, every woman, every child, regardless of their station or personality, weakness or wickedness, would ultimately be saved welcomed back by an embracing, understanding creator. God's salvation was offered to all, to the end, that is one early universalist put it, the last sinner will be dragged kicking and cursing into heaven. Universalist preachers proclaimed that every human being to be a child of God, quite naturally possessing, possessing their divine parents' inclination toward goodness and right, and thereby unavoidably drawn toward heaven in the health of God's all-powerful and same love. Universalism's lifeblood was the spiritual insistence that evil and pain that we now see in the world need not be a permanent and pervasive puritanism, and passionately believed that the natural inclination of God, humanity, indeed creation itself, toward good. American people, hungry for positive, hopeful, peace.
people-oriented religion blocked Universalist churches at one time in the 1840s. Universalism was the sixth largest American denomination. So what happened there? Because we're definitely not the sixth largest denomination, even combined with the Unitarians. The great Universalist theologian and preacher of the day was Reverend Hosea Ballou, every bit of the orator of his great awakening adversaries. Ballou used to hold his large congregation spellbound as he gently and joyfully proclaimed this gospel of universal salvation. Once, before a huge congregation in Philadelphia, he pointed to the children in his audience and expressed horror that many of the parents present this day held to the prevailing Calvinist assertion that their children were innately depraved, that most were already doomed to eternal damnation. Lifting his hand from the table and pointing over the crowd, he cried, Oh, dear man, dear woman, have you no connections to the world? Are you so insulated from human nature? I ask you to look at the companion of your bosom. Look upon the child of your love and say, if you believe it possible and probable, that these connections were originally doomed by the decree of heaven to everlasting wretchedness and derive consolation from that belief. And they're even more worthy than we are today. But the point is, he asked parents, do you believe your kids are condemned to go to hell at their young age already? This was, if you have heard anything about the beliefs of Presbyterianism, it's called predestination, that your life is laid out before you, uh, that you are either a sinner or a, a, a believer and a faith person and are saved or sinned. Uh, we can get into this later if anybody is interested in it. On another occasion, he was preaching in Boston when a rock sailed through the window and landed near him. Remember, I told you even way back then there was a real battle going on for the soul of America. Without missing a beat, this universalist evangelist picked up that large stone and said, This argument is solid and weighty, but it is neither reasonable nor convincing. Then putting the rock aside, he added, Not all the stones in Boston, except they stop my breath, shall shut my mouth. So, you can hit me with the rocks. As long as I breathe, I will preach the truth. If you kill me, that will be the only thing that will silence me. And other uh, early American universalists bravely preached the gospel of inclusion, reconciliation, hope, right off in the face of Calvinistic negativity. Gospel that unashamedly affirmed the oneness and worth of all persons. Now, when I first studied 18th and 19th century universalist thought during my years at Star King Seminary in Berkeley, I was profoundly taken by this bold and positive faith position. What captured my spiritual attention was the large and embracing spirit of universalism, the big, beautiful heart of universalism, the deep, compassionate conviction our universalist forebears had in the basic, deep down, unquenchable, unquenchable goodness of creation and human society and persons. In those days, I went so far as describing myself as a universalist Unitarian, not only because I was raised in a universalist church, but also by a way of affirming my interest in and allegiance to the universalist principles of inclusion, optimism, compassion, and hope. During my final year in seminary, I decided to do a chapel for the faculty and students at the school, at which time I planned to expound on this pure and lovely gospel of universal human affirmation. God, however, had a surprise for me. The morning the chapel was to happen, I arose early, poured over my powerful and polemically perfect text. You can tell this guy is college educated. I was privately proud in advance of the depth and passion in which I grasped the essence of my universal heritage. As I walked a mile or so up the hill from my home to the school, my head was drawn as I silently, my head was down as I silently rehearsed to myself all the beautiful phrases I had crafted to make my sermon on universalism come alive. As I approached the busy intersection of Shattuck Street, I happened to glance up and suddenly saw an incredibly large woman sitting on a bench waiting for the bus. Now, I have always had a personal obsession about my own weight, it's why I run marathons, and in those years was quite prejudiced and opinionated about people who weighed more than I thought they should. Anyway, before I could censor the unkind, judgmental thought, I blurted out to myself, Oh, dear God, look at that gross woman. She must weigh 400 pounds. How can anyone ever let themselves get like that? Who could ever love that? At that 
moment as if there was a bolt of spiritual lightning aimed right at me. The skinny little guy sitting next to her on the bus stop bench looked lovingly into her eyes, leaned over and gave her a most gentle and loving kiss. I have ever seen one human being bestow upon another. I was stunned and ashamed while I was still reeling from the jarring disparity between my petty, unkind judgment and his, his pure and simple love. A voice came to me, without words, but in unmistakable clarity, holiness, and power. A voice out of the whirlwind said to me, and to me alone, don't you get it, you dope? Here you are, at this very moment, going up the hill to preach your clever little sermon on God's love and universal salvation for every human person, and all you can do is sneer inside to someone you deem unworthy and unbeautiful. Don't you understand? In the eyes of all that is sacred and beautiful, the holy and true in this creation, she is utterly lovely as human beings yet. Don't you see? It is the pleasures and prerogatives, the graces and goodness of this creation are made for you, and you certainly claim them as a natural birthright for yourself. They are made for her too. And you call yourself a universalist? <laughs> Let me tell you, I was as startled as I was chastened. In the moments of pure and precious spiritual revelation, a spirit of holiness I can only call God spoke to me with heart numbing clarity. And I finally began to understand universally, viscerally, deep in my bones, what it means to be a universalist, a real universalist in more than name only, to have a heart that seeks and sees at every human turn, the natural worth and preciousness of people, all people, especially those very different from myself, in an instant I understood what a wild and welcoming doctrine our universalist forebears had bequeathed to us. And that doctrine can be summed up in stark simplicity. There is a place set in this creation for every last man, woman, and child. A precious, safe place has been set for each and every one of us period. It is our human job to respect, protect, and nurture the well-being of all God's diverse and curious children. The early, early universalists said, pure and simple, that every human being, no matter how strange or flawed or unlovable or broken or weird they may seem to be to you, is to be protected, cherished, and welcomed and loved. Now this is not an easy faith to have in the waning years of the 20th century or the beginning years. I do not, I need not point out but so much as human violence, cruelty, degradation. Just open the daily newspaper if you need evidence or look on Facebook or any of the other social media. Wars and civil wars, genocide, terrorism, torture, violations of human rights, domestic violence, sexual abuse of children. The manifestations of our human depravity are nearly endless. This is not an easy time to believe in the worth and redeemability of persons and society. But universalist, you see, universal and then, universalism then and now is not a naive and foolish bluebird faith, one that cannot see human wickedness, foible, and sin. It is rather a tenacious faith. Universalism is a promise to theologically hang in there with the complexities and cruelties of the human enterprise. It is the promise not to give up on people but to keep struggling in our broken world for the improvement and inclusion of all, even those one might naturally or even rightly despise, reject, condemn, or judge. They simply refuse to give up on people. They saw in humanity oneness and worth more than separateness and sin. But as everyone in this room and at home is no doubt painfully aware, many in our culture do not. Just as in 1793, when the Puritans and Universalists were theologically battering, battling in the public square for the hearts and minds of the American people, once again there is a struggle, a very real struggle, over the soul of our nation. Today, the religious right, who as you know are fervently vocal, fiercely organized, and frightfully well funded, is preaching the same negative and judgmental human message that Jonathan Edwards preached 200 years ago. The theological and social message of the religious right is exactly the opposite of universalism's tenacious acceptance of every human person. People like Pat Robertson and Jerry Falwell see the God and the Jerry Son, see God as an angry and punishing. They believe humanity must be divided, ripped asunder, sheep from goats, saints from sinners. 
They are not the least bit shy about declaring that religious, that righteous declinations, delineations must be drawn between the saved and the damned, between the right thinking and the wrong, between the pure and the defiled, between God's chosen religiously correct for whom a place has been set and the devil's legions, all others who don't see or live in the world as they do, for whom a place at creation's table in their worldview has not been set. You all heard Pat Robertson and Pat Buchanan in the last National Republican Convention and where else, where and every, every else and elsewhere since declare their holy war, their words, not mine, a jihad against all those who have different lifestyles, beliefs, values, worldviews, even social and political philosophies, which is what we are in today when liberalism is condemned as evil in the eyes of the religious right. And the vocal new Puritans who number in the many, many millions in this land, I think 70 is the last count I saw in the election, are not satisfied with swaying individuals to their worldview, the religious right demand that society and government be structured in ways that reflect their narrow perspectives and their narrow perspectives only. Surely it is clear to everyone in this room and at home that we ignore a modern day Jonathan Edwards and his angry, narrow, hateful religious vision at our own peril. I believe with all my heart and soul that in this time of the culture wars, we must answer the religious right. We must answer them pure and simple with the truth that is universalism. Does that seem like too bold a statement? Too dogmatic or opinionated? Well, by God, this third generation universalist, that's him, not me, uh, universalism, that big hearted faith that is the oneness and wonderfulness of people everywhere, even in all their diversity and difficulty, is good and true. Universalism is good and true. It is a sound and saving vision for the human family that can help us create a livable world for all. That is why we must not hide the light of our faith under some bushel of meek and mild politeness while the Jerry Falwells of the world preach their divine, divisive, fearful, and exclusionary will be the only one heard. We must boldly and unashamedly share our good news with every man, woman, and child of this creation, be they young, old, black or white, rich or poor, yellow or brown, liberal or conservative, gay or straight, beautiful or broken is a child of God, a valuable creature fashioned out of high and holy stuff, for which the place of life's table has been set. Wherever we are, however we find ourselves stationed in life, we must share that faith, tell that truth, live that ethic, and dare that dream. John Murray, the man who is credited with bringing universalism to America, put it this way, you only possess a small light, but uncover it, let it shine, Use it in order to bring more light and understanding to the hearts and minds of men and women. Give them not hell, but hope and courage. And that is the origin of the chapels. Looks like the chapels ran out of fluid. Let's hope that doesn't happen to all of us. Uh, we, must not, we must unashamedly stand up to this culture without arrogance or vitriol, and even perhaps with an appreciation for the integration and thoughtfulness of many evangelical Christians. Give voice to our theological beliefs and spiritual perspectives, just as our optimistic and unashamed universal, universalist forebears did. We must be the brave and forthright messengers of their optimistic and unashamed universal forebears. We must hold, hold the larger hope for the whole of human family. We must not sit back complacently in that self-satisfied smugness that is so common in right-thinking religious liberals that their centuries-old vision for a better, kinder world would die because of our sophisticated cowardice or neglect. We must speak and live and share the generous heart of universalism. The bottom line is, like it or not, we must be evangelists. Ooh, that's scary, isn't it? That's right, my good Unitarian Universalist brothers and sisters, evangelists, unashamed evangelists, willing to speak up for the kind and generous truth that is universalism. Now I realize the word evangelist may carry extreme negative connotations for many of you. Most who call themselves Unitarian Universalists probably think that evangelists as pushy, arrogant, obnoxious zealots who sell their religion door to door. Yeah, count me in. That does accurately describe many of the conservative Christian evangelists. I have had 
had misfortune of encountering over the years. But did it ever occur to you that the only reason you think so poorly of evangelists is that the next to nobody who thinks or feels as you do religiously ever engages in the process of publicly sharing their faith? Unitarian Universalists are notori notoriously spiritually silent because when we demand to think for ourselves, are respectful of human differences, and don't appreciate it when someone else tries to ram their beliefs down our throats, we tend to shy away from, even cautiously and respectfully, sharing with others what it is that we believe, and how those beliefs help us strive to be better, kinder, larger people. I know it's hard for some of us to talk back to fundamentalism by talking up our own faith, but I passionately believe we cannot afford such self-imposed silence in a dangerous and divisive time such as this. We can wish it all we want, we can wish it away all we want, but the truth is, the truth that the Falwells, the Robertsons, and the Buchanans are not going to just fade away. They are out there in the public square, on the public airwaves, they are running stealth candidates in local elections, trying to take over school and library boards, town and county offices, even national party structures in many states, and unless they are other gentle, unless there are other gentler versions of the human family being given voice, their divisive, mean-spirited, often hateful message will be the only one heard, and God help us, the only one believed. Is this guy a predictor of the future? This is 40 years ago he's talking about it. Unfortunately, it's all come true. If we remove ourselves from the religious playing field by being too nice, too polite, or non-confrontational to even say what it is we believe and why we believe it, and strive to live it in accordance with it, then they will carry the day and have their way with both us and the world, and neither we nor humanity can afford. So let us be kind, gentle, respectful evangelists for that hopeful, inclusive human vision bequeathed to us by our universalist forebears. The stakes are too high for anything less. And I have to warn you, it is not enough simply to speak about universalism with our lips. We must further speak it with our lives, with the deeds and doings of our hands and hearts. We must, as the African-American saying dove goes, talk the talk and walk the walk. And let there be no illusions about it, dear friends. Universalism is a tough and radical doctrine. It is hard and demanding. For it insists that we be consistently, we be constantly about the business of growing bigger, more inclusive, and caring hearts, setting aside our little fears and prejudices as we strive to care ever more widely for our brothers and sisters in this world. Universalism says, against all self protecting common sense, if there is a neighbor that needs a hand, you lend one. If there is a mouth that needs to be fed, you share some of what you have to eat. If there is a family that needs a home, you build one. If there is a captain who needs release, you remove the bars. If there is a mourner who needs comfort, offer your embrace. Well, not your embrace, not this time. Wear your mask, keep your distance, but offer your support. If there is a charity that needs support, write that check. If there is a stranger who needs welcome, open your home. If there is someone crying, use your finger to gently wipe away their tears. If there is a man or a woman or child anywhere in the world who needs your understanding, your compassion, your mercy, your support, your love, you give it. Give it unstintingly and selfishly. There is the demanding call. This is the demanding call of universalism. This is not a casual Sunday walk in the park. It's a tough, foolish doctrine of inclusion and care that constantly challenges us beyond the narrow confines of our natural selfishness and fear to ever wider circles of caring and compassion. I pray that in the days and years ahead, we who call ourselves Unitarian Universalists will speak the generous, inclusive, affirming spirit of universalism. Speak it with our lips as we answer those who live by mean and divisive little doctrines, and even more challenging, speak it with our lives. Speak it by God until everyone across this great and troubling land begins to hear on the wind the holy, inclusive voice that the poet Carl Sandburg heard. There is only one horse on the earth, and his name is all hooves. There is only one bird in the air, and her name is all wings. There is only one fish in the sea, and that fish's name is all fins. 
There is only one man in the world, and that man's name is all men. There is only one woman in the world, and her name is all women. There is only one child in the world, and that child's name is all children. There is only one maker in the world, and that maker's children cover the earth, and they are called all God's children. Amen. Very powerful lesson, and very appropriate even 40 years later. Any comments? All right, uh, moving on. Jessica Lynn has our offering statement. I came, I come on a Sunday feeling weary, having worn out the snooze button on my alarm clock. I come on a Sunday feeling frightened, having seared my eyes reading the latest news. I come on a Sunday feeling burdened, having fretted about my workday worries. But I leave Sunday service feeling refreshed, having been renewed by the spirit of love in the community that exists here. I leave Sunday service feeling whole, feeling lifted up by the words of righteous challenge. I leave Sunday service feeling energized, ready to continue our fight for peace and justice. This haven, this refuge, this place of worship and wonder exists because we make it so with our contributions, our gifts of time, our skills, our food, our love, our laughter, and our money. Please join me in giving that we may continue to have a place that fortifies and challenges us in these trying and troubled times. And as always, feel free to put something in the plate. Feel free not to put anything in the plate. Feel free to take something out of the plate. Uh, and if you're from outside, you can donate through the website or you can slip an envelope under the door. <laughs> Lloyd, and I apologize, I forgot to put the words up on the screen, which I usually do. <laughs> Closing in is 231.
Christmas spirit like some early music and oops, brings Christmas spirit is not the fish dish falling over. The uh, raised voices of people singing Christmas hymns. Uh, just I guess what you have to do is go back in your memory to when you were in church when you were a kid and there were like 150 people in there were all singing together. Isn't that that was just an amazing feeling? Okay. Uh, closing words is 702 in your hymnal. Where hate rules, let us bring love. Where sorrow, joy. Let us strive more to comfort others than to be comforted. To understand others than to be understood. To love others more than to be loved. For it is in giving that we receive and in pardoning that we are pardoned. St. Francis of Assisi, who as you know, also was an animal lover. All right, uh, let's see, let me do this before we let it fall there. This is what I just had to throw in. We're talking about animals. Everybody knows the platypus. This animal was, they think, left over at the end of creation and God had a bunch of leftover parts and he just kind of stuck them all together. This animal is amazing. It's a mammal, but it lays eggs. It has bioluminescent uh, fur. If you shine a black light on it, it will glow slightly green under a black light. Where did that ever come from? It is venomous. It has a spike in its tail, which can cause extreme pain, or it can poison you like a scorpion. And it uses electroreceptors to find its food. It has hairs on the side of its face. In other words, it hunts in the water for like snails and crustaceans and uh, little fish and because it can't see in the dark dirty water it uses like a dolphin it has like echo receptors or like a bat it doesn't use sound it uses the, the electricity that goes through any animal's movement when an animal moves it gives off a little electrical currents and they can sense these currents and that's how they find their their uh, meals just an amazing creation all right enough of the sidelight uh you're getting all kinds of extra stuff today uh, the post loop, please. Let's go out with a happy step, with a happy tune, and face those winds of divisiveness, that uh, nasty virus that is circling all around us. Wear your mask, wash your hands, keep your distance, uh, stay home as much as you can, and we hope to see you here next week or have you with us in spirit uh, on Facebook. Oh, I also forgot to mention, some people don't like Facebook. I'm not sure why. I think it's something about they don't like Zuckerberg giving money or giving him money. So what I'm trying to do is post everything on YouTube. I'm taking the, I'm copying the, 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 the uh, service from today, posting it on First Universalist Church of New Madison on the YouTube. You can go to YouTube and find that and you'll find the same thing. Although how, if I tell you about it on Facebook and you don't watch Facebook, how you're gonna know that, I don't know, but that's what we're gonna do. So uh, stay safe and uh, have a good, a good week. Bye-bye. <laughs>